Good morning, and thank you for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me here to this great place, your great hospital. I look forward to sharing my thoughts with you on a couple of issues with regard to um, hip reconstruction, both the preastabular osteotomy, as well as in adolescents and pediatrics. So, uh, just to start off with, um, Reinhold Gunn said when he was retiring, um, he said, anatomy is the nursery school of orthopedics, and everything I learned in my career, I learned in nursery school. And what he was doing was to reiterate the importance of knowing anatomy in terms of what you can do if you know the anatomy, in particular the blood supply. So these two pictures are fairly classic pictures for the blood supply to the proximal femur. Therefore, what can I do and what can I get away with doing in the proximal femur, as well as if you're doing an acetabular osteotomy, what can I do? So you are going to be doing dry bone workshops, but remember when you're doing these workshops, think about the anatomy, think about the muscles, think about the blood supply when you're doing those cuts. It's not just a question of cutting the bone. So as, as time goes by, and as um, Mark was saying, you know, hopefully you guys will come on and be better and bigger than we ever were in our careers. And, but, and so techniques will change, but often the principles of what we do remain the same. So in terms of hip morphology and hip conditions, we have a number of situations. We have evolution of the uh, our pelvis as humans, as well as the proximal femur, and we have the issues that are concerned around that evolution. What is the shape of our pelvis and acetabulum femur today in terms of what we do in our lives? And in, uh, coupled with that is what we do in our daily activities, sporting activities, repetitive motion, this concept of impingement, as well as acquired diseases that then affect the hip joint, particularly during adolescence and growth. So if we are going to do reconstruction, we have to understand what is normal, or what is apparently normal as far as our morphology is concerned, to interpret what is abnormal, and to correlate what is abnormal with what the patient presents with. Patients may have abnormal morphology, does not mean to say that that is the source of their problems, or indeed that they will get arthritis in the future. So you can see that both the femoral head morphology here, as well as the pelvic morphology in males and females does differ, and therefore their presentation sometimes also differs. So if we look at hip dysplasia, and um, the Scollin in 1924 was the first really to link the problem of dysplasia with the onset of osteoarthritis. And in dysplasia, essentially we have three different types. We have this type two, which is the short sore seal. So the sore seal, which means an eyebrow, comes over the top, it goes flat, but doesn't quite complete its growth to cover the femoral head and give a stable joint. And you have the type one dysplasia, the classic one that you always see, in fact, where you have this very steep sloping sore seal. And the combination of the two, where you have subluxation, it's short and it's sloping, which is probably the worst combination. But we also have to look at natural history, what happens to these conditions. So here's a child I saw at four years of age who still had residual dysplasia of the left hip. You can see the sloping acetabulum. It doesn't look quite normal, not well covered. There's mild subluxation of the femoral head. There's also mild immaturity of the capital femoral epiphysis in contrast to the right-hand side. However, doing nothing, and this child goes on to develop a normal hip age 12. And that's because of the growth of the lateral epiphysis. Also, what you see on x-ray does not necessarily reflect what is going in the hip joint. So if we did an MRI scan on this hip, you'd see that even at age four, that the soft tissue part, the, art, the cartilage, and the labrum are indeed covering the femoral head. So what's the goal of our reconstructive or osteotomy? Well, this goes back to Bombelli's mechanical study, biomechanical studies, looking at the structure morphology of normal and abnormal hips. And look at that um, orange portion you see there. And what he's essentially saying is that is, that there is the sore seal, that's the acetabular cover, and we have to reorientate that over the femoral head so we can redistribute the forces across that joint as normal as possible. The object of which is to preserve the cartilage. Professor Gantz gave us this, the etiology of osteoarthritis of the hip, an integrated mechanical concept, very much of the notion that the morphology you have and how you use your hip joint combined to give you the outcome of how that hip will last. So he, so he talked about the abnormal mechanics of the hip joint. This is how the patient will present to you in terms of limp, pain, muscle dysfunction, altered range of motion. Altered range of motion is quite important. So, for example, professional footballers. If I'm doing a medical report for a professional footballer who wants to sign a contract, and he doesn't have internal rotation of his hip joint, he doesn't get a contract. Because that means no internal rotation, he's impinging, 
sporting activities, high level sport, he's going to get early osteoarthritis. In combination with abnormal morphology, he talked about the femoral acetabular impingement concept. This causes cartilage damage, and that's the start of osteoarthritis in the hip joint. So he discovered this, um, or described this technique of peristabular osteotomy. The first one was done in 1984. They published the first 75 hips in 1988. And then this article came out in 2001, which was a, the burn experience of 700 peristabular osteotomies. And this article is interesting because all the things we understand today about what we should be doing, and perhaps have been forgotten, are contained in this article. So he said, there's a wide variation of shape. We know that from dysplasia. There's a wide variation in the severity of dysplasia. There are often associated femoral deformities. You just have to look for them. It's not just a question of doing a parastabular osteotomy. Often you have to do something more to the femur as well. And that there was a, this, you have this horseshoe type acetabulum, the cartilage. That's what you have to work with. You can't increase that in size. All you can do is reorientate that into the best possible position over the femoral head according to Bombelli's principles to help that cartilage last as long as possible, to normalize the biomechanics. You have to prevent impingement, and we'll see why. We also need to be able to image these patients as best we can to discover what is the morphology that we're dealing with and how can we correct that. It's a question of load versus cellular activity. So we know that in a pediatric hip, if you concentrically contain a stable um, femoral head within the acetabulum, the acetabulum will respond in shape will grow and cover the femoral head. If you don't, both the femoral head will become dysplastic and the acetabulum will become dysplastic. You see in this article by McKibben, um, quite a long time ago now already, he looked at the evolution of the different components of the femoral joint. So you saw that already the sphericity of the femoral head really had stopped changing by the age of about three years of age. It doesn't alter after that. The acetabulum continues during this time period to evolve and change. So this is the opportunity you have to do something about the hip joint to harness the power of nature to recreate a normal joint at the end. So today, we use multiple studies to look at uh, this MRI orthogram, to look at the morphology of the acetabulum, but also to look at the quality of the cartilage. So this is looking at the a delayed Galilee Mahan scan, looking at the quality of cartilage. Lots of red means bad cartilage. That means that cartilage is damaged already. You can do whatever you like to the acetabulum, to the femur. You can whatever osteotomy you like, that hip will fail. The cartilage has failed. So this is the GARP study, which is genetics, and looking at the osteoarthritis susceptibility genes. These are genes that dictate whether you, in your lifetime, even with a normal hip, may get osteoarthritis, and the association between abnormal morphology and the onset of osteoarthritis. So this is a lady, 93 years of age. She clearly has abnormal hip morphology but she has lasted 93 years. Clearly her genetics in terms of a cartilage quality has been very good. Also we're looking at, increasing these days, the importance of the lateral development of the epiphysis in uh, teenage girls and boys, that last development of the acetabulum, including in particular the chondrolabral junction, the labrum here. And you can see that if you start, the labrum starts to degenerate, or you start doing anything with labrum, you'll alter the joint mechanics create increased shear, and therefore accelerated degeneration of the, of the cartilage. As far as we know today, the function of that chondrolabral junction labrum is to do with joint seal, fluid mechanics, which is therefore important for cartilage nutrition, stability and load sharing. So we need to manage that labrum. You can't just do an osteotomy, you need to understand what is that chondrolabral junction pathology you have present, and do I need to also repair that at the same time? We know that in patients over the age of 80, cadaver studies, 90% of these people had labral tears. So doing an MRI orthogram and comes back saying there's a labral tear does not mean anything. If you do partial labrectomy at arthroscopy with these patients, short-term results are fine if it's just a tear. And a lot of these will have asymptomatic tears anyway. But if they have a cartilage lesion, which means that there's an abnormal morphology or an injury that has resulted in this condition, then your short-term results are very bad indeed. Less than 21% do well. If you repair the cartilage, however, the, the labrum, you get a much better response. You get better strain, equal to intact specimens. There's less progression of osteoarthritis. And the symptoms are certainly improved over and above those who underwent um, resection. So we started off with arthroscopy in sports medicine doing a resection of the torn labrum, and now we're repairing the labrum. And those who have a deficient labrum 
we're actually reconstructing that label because of the importance of this concept of the condolabral junction. Well, does injury make joints old? And certainly in this study, they saw that there was a complex interaction between joint aging and the induction and clearance of what we call cellular senescence. This is the natural dying process of cartilage cells. Cartilage cells start to die, and unfortunately they then influence the cartilage cells next to them, who then also start to die off. So if we can clear these old cells out of the joint, we can slow that process down. Moreover, injury, joint injury, where a microfracture or acute injury, microtrauma or acute injury, results in an increased oxidative stress levels within cartilage, and that too results in cartilage degeneration. So if we can give a medical therapy to reduce oxidative stress, then that's also going to improve the longevity of the cartilage cover. So how are we doing with preastabular osteotomies? Well, we do know that even if you do just a preastabular osteotomy, that that cartilage on subsequent follow-up will improve in quality. We also know this from the knee joint. If you're doing high tibial osteotomies, you realign the knee, the knee, you offload that medial compartment, you'll get improvement in the cartilage of the medial compartment of the knee. So merely the biomechanical effect of offloading the diseased cartilage does certainly improve the joint. So cartilage remains the issue, and so we are now using these advanced studies to look at the quality of cartilage before you actually go on and do the operation. So in this situation here, you can see that in this hip here, this is all red, okay, you can see this is clearly dysplastic, it's subluxating, very small surface area over which the weight is distributed, that's bad cartilage, and need to say that hip very quickly goes on to require a joint replacement. On the other side of the same patient, not quite as bad, and that hip remains preserved somewhat longer. So cartilage remains the problem, and today we know that if you're doing a parastabular osteotomy, the best cases to select for your osteotomy are those in the under 30 year olds, good to excellent congruency, tonus grade one osteoarthritis, so very early stages, when your quality of the cartilage you see on these special scans is good, and the patients have a good range of motion. So good range of motion and congruency is something that goes way back to Tonus and Salter and Wagner and all these people way back in the early days of Bombelli recognized the importance of these two issues before you do any sort of osteotomies around the hip joint. So this is the parastabular osteotomy and more will come in the next talk about how you do this and the, and the issues of it. But it is very important because it's a three-dimensional structure. Remember your, your acetabulums are sitting at an angle off your pelvis and therefore how you rotate these is very important in terms of the cover you get over the femoral head. But it's not a question of just doing the osteotomy. You need to do other things. You need to deal with the intra-articular pathology already present in that particular patient. So you may want to deal with femoral head cysts by doing some impaction grafting to maintain that subchondral bone plate, which is important for maintenance of good cartilage. You may want to look at the ligamentum teres, if it's torn, deal with intra-articular cartilage flaps as you would in the knee joint. I said before, the labrum is the labrum's important. This is a normal looking labrum. Here we just have a labral tear near the labral chondral junction. And that kind of situation, we're starting to get damage to this cartilage here. This cartilage is still normal. But if that becomes damaged, then slowly it spreads across the rest of the joint. So then you may want to repair that. And you can do that either arthroscopically, or you can do an open repair at the time of doing your acetabular osteotomy. And don't forget, if that's the situation, the labral tear is not the issue. Unless you're a sports person who had an acute incident doing high jump, long jump, dancing, ice dancing, with the case may be is, there is an abnormal morphology that caused that problem. You need to deal with the cause of that, not just that tear. Cartilage, um, again, what we can do with cartilage, so this is a carpet flap tear of the cartilage. Underneath, this is fairly stable on this side. So this side, we can do a microfracture like you see here. We can put that back and glue that back into place. We can do osteochondral grafts, and we can do autologous matrix induced cartilage um, implantation, all to try and preserve the cartilage. All short-term results, not really long-term results yet. That is the holy grail in terms of what we're trying to do. Don't forget, what is the morphology that caused this problem? And often is this CAM lesion and or pincer in the case of the females. You need to identify that. And again, either arthroscopically or open, remove the CAM lesion so that's not causing, perpetuating the problem in the hip joint. If you just repair that labrum and the cartilage and don't deal with the abnormal morphology, it'll just recur uh, very soon. So it is important that we look at the... Um, what we have today in terms of hip reconstruction, joint preserving surgery, that's we have osteotomies, we have arthroscopies, and we have hip replacements in patients. 
The other way of using a parastabular osteotomy is not only for displays, a classic dysplasia, but you can have retroversion of the acetabulum, either global retroversion, whole acetabulum is turned, or just the superior rim is retroverted. So this is a standardized x-ray. If you do not have a standardized x-ray, you cannot measure anything on the x-ray. All the measurements you do will be meaningless. So it's very important to have a standardized x-ray, then you can do some measurements. And in a retroverted acetabulum, what you'll see on the standardized x-ray, here you don't see the ischial spine, here you'll see the ischial spine and this crossover sign. So this is the anterior wall, and this part is protruding further than it should be. Normally it should be one-third and one-half. So one-third anterior wall, one-half is the posterior wall. You can do a CT scan, and here you can see clearly the retroversion of the entire acetabulum. So we can do what we call an antiverting preastabular osteotomy. That's an osteotomy where you take from this position, you don't do that with it, give more cover, you do that with it to change the version uh, in the acetabular cup. This is what happens if you don't take standardized x-rays. He has a patient who's standing, AP pelvic x-ray. What you're looking at is almost an inlet view. You're almost looking down into the pelvis. You can see how round the inlet is here and how small the, 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 these, the obturator foramen are. This gives you a completely different picture to this one. Here you can see this is the anterior wall here, a very small anterior wall. But this is a supine. Now we're getting more of an outlet view. So again, how you tilt your pelvis in taking the x-ray will change the measurements you do on your x-ray. So one looks well covered, the other one looks dysplastic. So you can either have global cover, uh, at retroversion of the acetabulum, or just a superior edge. So you can take this acetabulum, you can see the crossover, do a parastabular osteotomy, and change the whole version of the entire cup. Or what you can do is you just have the superior rim that's causing impingement, you can take down the labrum, trim off the rim, repair that without having to do a complete parastabular osteotomy. So again, imaging is important to decide where is the impingement in this patient? Is it the whole acetabulum or just a small portion of the acetabulum that's a problem? And what we're trying to do when we correct the acetabulum is take that cup, like Bombelli said, and reorientate it in the best position possible for that patient. So this is a chart looking at your center edge angle and your alpha angle. So that is the acetabular portion as well as the femoral portion. Putting those two together and see what is the optimal match for your hip. What we're trying to do is get this complex rotation of a parastabular osteotomy, and I'll we'll talk about this in the next talk on QA, into this sort of box area, because this is an area of maximum reduced stress during daily activities for that combination of femoral head and acetabulum. And to do this, often we need 3D CT scanning, where we look at both the acetabulum, the morphology, as well as the head and neck junction to see what section do we actually have to resect. You don't have to resect at all, just the portion that is abnormal. We can also use the parastabular osteotomy for patients with iatrogenic or acquired hip instability. So cases where, for example, this patient's had an arthroscopy, they haven't re recognized, in fact, that there's actually an anterior wall dysplasia. The patient's gone on to instability of the hip following arthroscopy, and it's required an acetabular osteotomy to correct that over under coverage. There are also hip conditions like in Down syndrome, Kabuki syndromes, various laxity syndromes, where this laxity of the, of the head, and it can actually, in Down syndrome, spontaneously dislocate. In those situations, again, a triple or preastable osteotomy may well be appropriate. And again, as we said before, in Gunther's original paper in 2001, he said, often they are associated femoral deformities. So in doing the preastable osteotomy, you may have to combine that with proximal femoral osteotomies, and this is a case of North Perthes disease, We've transferred the trochanter. And here, this is the Morsha osteotomy, as you saw early on. We've done a leg lengthening, a transfer of trochanter. We've done an osteotomy here. We've covered it with a preastable osteotomy. And this is a slightly older slide, so you can see we've used these metal suture anchors to repair the labrum as well. However, these patients are not lasting in a lifetime. So if they're not lasting in a lifetime, what happens? Well, our salvage operation is a very good operation today. It's called a total hip arthroplasty. So how are these patients doing in terms of total hip arthroplasty or in comparison? Do we just say, we can't last a lifetime, it's abandon this operation and just do hip replacements? Well, these two papers looked at a comparison. This patient, this in the same patient, hip replacement, pressed hip osteotomy. This one using oste uh, hip uh, joint replacement as well as PAO. And they looked and said, they were comparative in terms of complications and outcomes in these patients, but not long term. 
The Bernese group looked at this and said, well, if we do paracetamol osteotomy, do we compromise total hip replacement? Because that's important. If this is going to be our end stage, our salvage procedure after this operation, is it as good as a, as a routine primary hip replacement? And they said that, generally speaking, yes, it was. Hip replacement was standard, primary, no problems, apart from if you malorientate your acetabulum in doing a paracetamol osteotomy, Often the joint replacement surgeons will orientate their cup according to that acetabulum. And they may malorientate their cup, so that's a danger. If you also do a combined femoral procedure on the femur and you influence the greater trochanter and or the shaft, that will compromise total hip arthroplasty. And that hip arthroplasty, therefore, won't last as long as standard primary. And often these patients are coming back at fairly young adults to have their first joint replacement. What are the long-term outcomes of the prastabular osteotomy? Well, at the moment, we have sort of medium term, intermediate term, not really such long term, except there's one paper from, from Byrne down here, which is a 30 year follow up. They had a 32% survival rate. In other words, two thirds had gone on, approximately two thirds had gone on to have hip replacements. So it's important to consider, what am I doing now? These patients will go on to have hip replacement uh, in the future. How do these hips fail in terms of um, the, the perastable osteotomy? Well, if you don't deal with intraarticular lesions, you have altered rotation, in other words, afterwards you have any impingement following periostabular osteotomy, the results decrease, get worse. If you've had failed hip arthroscopy, these patients often end up having a worse periostabular osteotomy afterwards, so it's important to select your patients. If you have advanced arth uh, arthritis, we said before, any incongruency after your, after your correction, so you need to do functional views before you do osteotomy, abduction functional views to see what is the congruency of the hip joint after my periastabular osteotomy. You need to know that in advance of doing your osteotomy. An older age of surgery, any complications, of course. So in terms of periastabular osteotomy, our key questions are really are, what do we do with the patient who comes to you who incidentally, you find, has dysplasia, the borderline, 20 to 25? Which of these patients are actually going to go on to develop problems, early arthritis? That also is some degree dependent upon their genetics. But what do we do with these patients? Do we offer them a periastabular osteotomy? Or do we wait until they become symptomatic? If they are symptomatic at that stage, well, that means they are symptomatic because the, the hip joint is starting to wear and deteriorate. We know that the worse that is, the worse the outcome of the operation. So I think the top tips really are, if you're doing this oste operation, obviously do it correctly without complication. Be aware of the labrum, repair it if you need to. We know resection is bad. Make sure that having done your correction, that you do not have at the end of your operation impingement. You need to check the range of motion of your operation Am I, do I have any impingement? What Professor Guns used to do was to make the resident put his finger between the hip joint and the acetabulum, put the hip up, and, the, and if the resident said it was our, you know it was an impingement. Accurate realignment, strict patient criteria selection, and also get some idea of the quality of the cartilage in the patient you're dealing with before you do the operation. Thank you.